Okay, and we are recording. Um, okay. So welcome to the podcast. I'm Kuhn van Seyen, your host. Today I'm joined by Geoff Burke, founder of Agroecological, all the way down in New Zealand. This is an experiment where we try to dive deep into regenerative agriculture projects on the ground, and where we're also recording video as we go over the projects with Geoff today. Find all the links below in the description, and please let us know what you think. Agroecological is a New Zealand-based impact investment manager and advisory firm focused on farmland. Welcome, Geoff. Morning. Thank you. Okay. And so. And good evening. Right? Yeah. Good evening. Good morning. Good morning. We're we're very far <laughs> apart, and there's a slight delay sometimes in yeah. the in the connection. So it's all it's a it's a good experiment to do. Uh, for the first time, actually, on this podcast, we we have a video connection, so it's going to be it's going to be very interesting to see how that turns up. But to start with. Uh, with a personal question, why and how did you end up in soil? I mean, you are from New Zealand where farming is a huge industry, but, but still you could have chosen many other career paths. Yes, it's a good question. I'll try and keep it short. We could be here all, then, all morning slash evening. Um, so essentially I'm from a, a farming background. I um, was brought up on a beef and cheap property. Um, my father always said that if we had have had a restaurant, we would have done it from paddock to plate. So... The family was involved with farming, livestock buying, butchery, uh, meat exporting. Um, so pretty much everything else except um, restauranting. Uh, so I, th I think um, it's kind of in you and you have an appetite for it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I went and studied it at university, but um, uh, <laughs> I think like a lot of young men in the 1980s who were from farming backgrounds, I ended up in investment banking. Uh, because farming wasn't looking terribly clever. I don't think in many places in the in the 80s. So, um, but I just got to that point in, in life where I think I couldn't escape my genes. And they started sort of vibrating uh, particularly strongly. And so um, ended up pursuing um, particularly organic agriculture because I got interested. Well, you know, firstly, because I was involved with futures and options. I started to get interested from the, the, the deal point of view because uh, this organic stuff seemed a lot more expensive. So therefore, did that mean the farmers were making more money? Uh, and, uh, you know, having covered some of it at university, I could sort of intellectually get my head around it and that, that New Zealand would probably be quite good at it. Um, and so that's why I went back and did my postgraduate work um, back in New Zealand at Lincoln University. And, and then it sort of expanded from there. So, yeah, that's trying to keep it short. That's how we got into Thank it. Thank you really. for that. Yeah, because otherwise we could we could easily cover a full hour probably on this. I, I want to bring up uh, the. Easy. I will share my screen and bring up actually the presentation of um, your company, Agroecological, and you can basically let's say briefly um, the same brief as you use now to introduce that. I can <laughs> click through it if you want. Just just let me know uh, which slides right. you want to yep. want to see. And with that, we go to the full screen. There we are. So I will move our video to the middle so you can actually see it. So t tell me, Agroecological, what it is, what you do, who, who is we in that sense, how many people are you, and, and why? I mean, you, you are from New Zealand, but, but what's the, the, yeah. the reason of the base so, in New Zealand? Um, well, we are in New Zealand now, but um, started off in the UK. Um, I've spent probably 20 out of the last 25 years in the, in the UK. So, yeah, I guess you lived there for a long time, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. And worked at the Organic Research Centre over there in Berkshire for a number of years. So um, came back to New Zealand about five years ago. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the name, the name is because it's kind of does what it says on the tin. Um, it's one of those, those names that, that captures exactly what it's, what's it, what it's about. Um, and I think just what we wanted to try and achieve. So we're a small team. There's just a handful of us. Um, but I think what we really wanted to try and achieve was, was genuine transformation to drive change. And one of the limiting factors around uh, the perception of, of ecological agriculture or regenerative agriculture, however you want to term it, is that uh, it is less profitable and that people do it purely for philosophical almost as religious reasons. Uh, and, you know, my experience of having been on a lot of farms is that that, that was wrong. And, and particularly here in a New Zealand context, um, that you had the ability to create a more profitable system 
particularly if you could capture a premium, but even potentially without capturing that premium, you had the ability to run a, a leaner, more resilient system. And so really it was about that. It was about proving uh, that we could uh, create a system that was more environmentally uh, positive um, and that we would also drive, you know, good, if not better, financial returns and being able to demonstrate that through actually doing it. So that's really sort of how it came about, if you like. And, and it's really based because we, we use the term organic a lot. We use the term regenerative a lot. For you, it's, it's really that's, it's almost a step. I mean, organic is the official certifier, but you, you cannot really be organic, or the official certification, you cannot really be organic without being regenerative, at least in, in your experience and in your circumstances. Yeah, I, I mean, that's right. That's how I view it. And I, I know there are different views around the world and, and people who say there's sort of corporate organic and stuff like this. But um, for me, if you're doing it as well as you possibly can, then you're relying on on ecological science or agroecological science. Um, and, and, and so if you like, being regenerative is a byproduct of implementing uh, sound, robust, um, best, if you like, agroecological management practice, um, which QED makes you uh, organic uh, because all those techniques are things that fall within the sort of the, the sort of the specifics of, of organic um, certification. And really organic is just, you know, the way I view it is that organic is important because it's a stamp. Um, it's independently audited and it gives uh, consumers some comfort and that drives the premium. And that's important because it makes it more profitable. And the more robust and profitable it is, and the more likely it is to drive more money into it and then see more organic agriculture being rolled out. Um, and, you know, it's been successful for, for 20, 30 years, um, but really hasn't expanded, you know, perhaps as much as we, we need it to, thinking about climate change and other sort of environmental challenges uh, and thinking about how much capital goes into agriculture um, as a whole, but, and how much of that goes into organic, you know, it's, research, it's still a fraction. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah ex exactly. Um, so there's still a fraction of, you know, uh, capital flow going into, to, you know, this very important, or what we view as very important area in terms of, um, creating good food, creating good environmental outcomes, uh, adapting to and dealing with uh, climate change and the consequences of climate change. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up the next picture as you see the soil from, from underneath. I think there's a, there's a fundamental uh, misunderstanding in, our, in organic where, where many people see it as um, just replacing um, a few, the chemical inputs you're using with some organic inputs probably getting a lower, lower yield if you do that. Like if you don't do, if you don't push the system as far as you're doing, as you're mentioning, like we, you can really push it much further, meaning that you get a lower yield, which are usually the farms you see in, in ending up in research. And thus you have that, um, that, that tendency of saying, we cannot feed the world with this because everybody has 20 or 30% lower yields, which is not yeah. the case if you look at, I mean, it really depends where you take these, these examples. Plus there's, there's only a fraction of the money went into research so far, meaning that we're really at the beginning. I've seen farms that are maybe five or even sometimes even 10 times better in, in yields. And you're mentioning before, and actually Nicole, um, you, we should focus on profit per acre and not yields per acre, but there we're, we haven't pushed the organic system as far as we can in yields, but also in profits and also in quality. And we're just at the beginning. I mean, it's a 20, 30 year thing and in, in compared to 50 or 60 maybe. And in, uh, in, so it's, there's an interesting discussion yeah. going on around that, which makes me always feel a bit uncomfortable with people say, but can you actually feed the planet with that? And I say, yes, if you do it well, <laughs> if you do it well, but that's always the case. If you do it in a bad way and you just replace a few things here and there, of course you can't because you're just, you're a bad farmer, basically. Yeah. And, Sorry, and that's, that's a not, bigger that's not topic. Really a question, but it's, it's more a state. Yeah. No, but it, it, it's a good one because it does come up. Um, and then, then we get into the whole debate. Well, why is it that people are going hungry? Is it because we're not producing enough food? Well, in the West, we've got sort of a high obesity level. So clearly we're not lacking producing food. Yeah, it's um, about 2.5 billion with so obesity. So it's more, much more about logistics and availability. Yeah and poverty and, and these types of things. So we, we don't have a, an inability to produce sufficient food. We, we absolutely do. And um, from an organic perspective, certainly the systems I know and know well, um, 
there is minimal yield penalty, if any. And certainly, you know, from our point of view, from pastoral point of view, from uh, permanent crops such as kiwi fruit, there is no reason why we wouldn't be in the top three, five percent, and purely for production. Uh, certainly in terms of profitability. So I, I think it's a little yeah, right, bit of a... Right, because we're going to dive so, into dairy and, and kiwi in a minute. Yeah. But let's let's yeah. uh, dive a bit into the, the nuts and bolts of of not doing it the conventional, or let's say conventional. Okay, so not... Just yeah. replacing replacing yeah. a few inputs from chemical to organic and then calling it a day. No, you're, you're saying organic is meant to be. And I've had this discussion before where people say the spirit of organic is constant tinkering and constant changing. And that's how they designed it. Now, the certification in some places is very rigid, but that wasn't how the original pioneer started. And, and so what's your, let's say your take, you can take a, complete, a, a concrete example. We might go into Kiwis uh, later on, but if you want to concrete, take a concrete example now, yeah. uh, what would um, be your, your well, definition of regenerative organic? I think he, you, well, you raise an interesting point, um, and this is one I, we often talk about, and that is that it's often perceived to be, so organic agriculture is often perceived to be um, a case of substituting conventional inputs for organic inputs. Um, and so that's fundamentally flawed. That's not what it is. And those are usually the systems that, that fail. And so, for instance, you'll see farmers who say, oh, organic doesn't work. And generally what they're saying is that um, their input, we could tell them beforehand um, that that was the case, which would probably save them a lot of trouble. So it's much more about not even redesigning your, your management system, I suppose designing your management system, but it's much more about creating a new management system and, and having an understanding of how you're going to create health and success in that system, so resilience. Jeff, can you just repeat so that? So because forth. the connection and froze for a second big, and it was a crucial point. Oh, did it? <laughs> Oh no! Well, I can't remember. What, well, I don't know where I. I no, you, to, you you cut off at the moment where you said uh, organic doesn't work. So people say when they just replace okay. a few things, organic yeah, doesn't work. So stop, I, 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 yeah, I've literally had that conversation with someone, and but they had effectively gone down that input substitution route. So take the conventional and put out, put the organic one in, and so that you know that doesn't work, and. Um, you know, if, if someone was going to adopt that approach, we could tell them beforehand, before they even got started, that it isn't going to, to work. Because what you need to do is, is redesign your system, or, or if you like, even say, put in place a new system. And that's about management, and it's about, um, you know, what's going on up in here, just as much as it is what's going on down in the soil and, and the pasture. Um, so that's, the, and that's where you get success through creating that health, um, that resilience, and so on in your, your system. But it comes back to that that management system. It's not just take that thing out, put that one in instead. And that's crucial because generally most farmers will think that's what it's about because that's how they've been educated to think of farming. Is that then the most difficult piece? Like the changing the mind of the farmer or, or nudging the mind of the farmer? or? Yeah, um, I, I would say certainly right now experience in New Zealand is that there are a lot of people who are very interested more than I have ever seen before. Uh, there's much less of the sort of, you know, laughing into your hand or, um, you know, making sort of yeah, jokes about back. it uh, yeah. because people, yeah, because people are recognizing that actually, you know what, the current system isn't working. There's a whole lot of regulation coming in around water quality because water quality is not great as a consequence of intensive dairying and, uh, and people, people in New Zealand don't like it. I'm sure people anywhere don't like their degrading water quality. Uh, and so, you know, that, that change is being driven. That's not the only sort of change, but it, through that, it, it's starting to change. And people are thinking, well, how do I farm to be within the regulations, to be, uh, if you like, to have, have a social license to farm, and then to also make it profitable so I can continue farming with my family and, and perhaps pass it on to my sons or daughters or whoever it is. So those sort of uh, questions are, are really quite in play strongly in New Zealand. And so that means... I, I'm finding that I'm engaging with, with farmers and talking to them about, um, well, let's develop the system, let's develop that system, what are you thinking about doing? And, and everyone that I'm talking with is saying, well, yeah, well, we're interested in you know, finding out more about organic, how do we do it? Or um, you know, how do we make that system work? So I would say right, right now, and this is um, based on our New Zealand experience, that it's, it's a really good time to be seeking to put those systems in place because I think farmers are very open 
to that, but certainly the, it's, it's up here, that's the most important part of the system to convert. Um, that is, say, the appetite for it, the genuine interest in it is good. And the great thing about New Zealand is that you get a lot of very capable farmers. You know, it's a big sector here. It's a major sector. Um, so capable young men and women go into the sector. We'd probably like to see more uh, going in, but um, there's plenty out there. And what's interesting is that, if you like, the most motivated um, ones are the ones who are interested in, in pursuing this more sustainable line. Um, you know, they have more of an appetite for it. And that's good because it does it does require you to be ahead of the curve a little bit, you know, to be in sort of the top 10, 20 percent of, of conventional operators. That those are the guys who are going to make it make it work. And and it puts you it puts you struggling in, 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 it goes in the yes, and in, that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so let's see what I don't remember. Here we're going to talk about in a minute, Kiwis. And let's see. I mean, your agroecological is interesting, obviously. You wrote a few very interesting papers, which I'm going to um, list below on yield and, and okay. all of that, which is, uh, which is very interesting. And I think, I mean, some beautiful pictures in New Zealand. How big is the farming industry? And, and you mentioned before in, in, a, in a conversation we had, it's basically, I mean, you never have to put the animals inside. It has the perfect climate. Is, is there changing a lot in the climate right. as well? Is there yeah. like a risk so in the next we, 20, 30 years? We have or? a remarkably... Um, benign climate. You know, we're very lucky with our climate. Uh, so animals can be outside grazing all year, year round. Um, to some extent, that does depend on your your soil. Um, but yeah, look, we don't. Um, there are not there are not large parts of New Zealand, certainly not a, not large farming parts that are under snow. Um, pretty much nowhere in the North Island will be getting snow in, in the farm, except up on the peaks, the hills, or something. But but it's not, it's, no, it's not like Northern Europe or, or North America. It just doesn't. And grass, grass will grow all year round in, in large areas of the country. It might slow down or stop in some places in, in sort of uh, July, you know, the middle of winter. Um, but uh, otherwise, you know, you, you keep growing. So, uh, and you just, you know, to, to compensate for that lack of pasture growth, you, You're far. you yeah. harvest if you harvest in your, your peak season and you feed it out in your, yeah. sub season so we've got a fantastic climate we've also got rain um and good soils uh and sunshine so we have sunshine we have heat units we have water um you have that ability to graze outside all year round um that ability to grow things is is the basis of the country's economy really um you know, there's a certain amount of tourism, which is pretty important, um, particularly when sort of Lord of the Rings and films like that get made and people come down and visit. But uh, yeah, it's really about food production and that comes back to the climate, the quality of the climate we have, which is is a real blessing. And it's almost all export, I assume. Yeah, look, there's 4 million people in this country and uh, I think we produce enough food for, well, I've heard various sort of measures, but you know, sort of 40, 50, 60 million. So, I think literally 95% of what New Zealand produces is exported. So in, in the context of the global economy, from an agriculture point of view, we're extremely important. Uh, dairy, I think we're around one third of globally traded dairy product. Um, I think we're the, the biggest exporter of kiwi fruit, um, or Zespri at least is the biggest exporter of kiwi fruit, the, the New Zealand uh, kiwi fruit marketer. Um, lamb, we're the number one exporter of um, lamb. So, and apples, we're not number one, but we're very big um, from, again, from an export point of view, just because, uh, you know, every, pretty much everything we produce, whatever it is, will be going overseas. And, and just on, on this slide, one thing I always like to ask, uh, measurable environmental yes. performance, what, what's the, what, what are you measuring? What would you like to measure? Because it's not always the same thing. And yeah, what are no, customers no, asking? What are investors asking you're working with? What, what's that, what's your, has been your experience on the measurement part? Okay, so um, those are some interesting questions. So th there's been a rise in impact investment, but um, investors we are talking to uh, seldom, and I'm, I, might, I think I can only think of one, but they're seldom ar articulating, uh, we need these particular metrics. We need to see that you're measuring this. Pretty much everyone we talk to are, um, are super happy with the approach we're taking and, and um and it's quite, kind of a case of, well, we say, well, we're going to measure these things and they go, wow, that's, that sounds fantastic. So, and I think, I think it's so juxtaposed with what they're otherwise seeing. 
So there's such a sort of a, a separation between, if you like, the norm and what we're doing. So in terms of what we would like to measure, well, some of them are relatively straightforward to do, and that's biodiversity is, is a fairly obvious one. Um, some are very important, but much more technically difficult to do, which is water quality. Um, but in, in doing that, there, there are mechanisms you can, you can use. And then also we're looking to work with um, regulators in certain catchments who are monitoring water quality and to do that over time. You know, some of these things are not quick fixes, but we're quite keen to see, see how we can record that, that change and how that happens at, at sort of a, a micro level. So at the farm level, and then also in the wider catchment level, particularly when you, if you start to get multiple farms under, under management, um, then it'd be interesting to see how you can um, identify those, those differences. Um, but otherwise it, it becomes things such as, um, you know, you talk about putting particular environmental mitigations or management actions in place that you say are going to make a difference. Um, so the first thing would be to do to measure is that, well, have you actually done those things that you said you were going to do? Um, and to some extent, you know, science hasn't caught up with good management practice. So an example of that would be if you uh, sow a really diverse mixture of pasture, you know, some of that's pretty deep rooting. And so you're, you're better holding on to, uh, to nutrient in that, that soil than if you've just got really you know, very short rooted um, grasses. Well, that isn't picked up, for instance, in New Zealand in the, in the nutrient monitoring system. So you get no benefit out of having that pasture system versus having, say, a very short um, rooted ryegrass. So the, the science, to some extent, has to catch up um, in terms of its ability to measure those differences. But, you know, nonetheless, those are the sort of things we're putting in place because we know they make a, a difference from a lot of different points of view, you know, health of the animals and, and performance, as well as retaining nutrient and so on and so forth so are you measuring carbon yeah, like like your your big uh, neighbor australia is doing yeah, yeah. there's a sort of a market there but i don't know the situation that well in uh, in, in your part yeah, just just sort of cranking up again actually um and uh, so probably literally the last couple of weeks carbon has become much more of a topic um with farmers that i'm talking to so um there is a a billion trees program as it's called here in new zealand where the government is is encouraging people to get out there and plant trees. Um, and uh, uh, you may be familiar with uh, Manuka honey. Uh, you probably have it on your, your toast this morning. And um, so there's an opportunity there to plant more of that, Manuka and Kanuka and, and make oil and honey um, and also sort of, you know, lock up some, some carbon. So it's a really interesting area. It's just growing. Um, super interested in that because I think, you know, more silver pastoral type systems are uh, something that is of interest to us and it totally links in with with that so um and that look be great to be able to measure that um and create more income um and yeah so i think that's that's something that you will see increasing and it's something we, we will pursue on farm you know without yeah you're without probably one of the fastest saying, you know, ways as well to to do soil to rebuild soil yeah. carbon levels as well yeah mm -hmm. Absolutely, and trees grow super fast in this country. You know, something that might take 60, 80 years in, um, say, the UK will grow here in about 2025. So it's, um, you know, dramatically different. As I say, it's the, yeah. the warm yeah. width just makes such a difference. Great. I think we're going to switch to, as we're talking about trees, we're going to talk about kiwis. And okay. so I'm switch the presentation well, for a second. It's fine rather than trees but yeah I'll, no it's, it's a slightly i mean you can see my my complete <laughs> lack of knowledge on, on <laughs> so we're gonna dive into that i mean they i i've picked them before and uh, not on a farm but in a small um, uh, near our place so it's um you mentioned before it's one of the biggest um you're one of the biggest players as a country i mean one of your marketing the, the marketing company that uh, most people when they eat a kiwi at least one in two or something comes from from new zealand what is it with, I mean, this is a beautiful yeah. picture. Let me check the next one to have a nice background one. This is a lot of text, so we're not going to do that. Um, let's keep the, the Kiwi one. Why are you pushing yeah, yeah. for regenerative organic? And, and why is that such an interesting uh, development at the moment in, in New Zealand? Mm, so um, the, the actual, there's, there's the interest. Okay, there's the, there's the pure market interest. So you, you, you attract a premium for being organic. Um, and the market is growing, you know, sharply, North America and Asia. So that, that's the exciting um, 
dollar driven end of it, if you like, and um, which is quite compelling. And that there is a, a marked shortage of supply and the ability to change that rapidly in a short space of time just simply doesn't exist. So that that's very compelling. Um, the second thing from a production point of view is that um, we have identified a um, sort of unique agronomic advantage in a particular location. Um, and it's connected to how kiwi fruit grow or how they are made to grow. Um, and essentially kiwi fruit need to have winter chilling. So they, they need to be warm. And, and that means and winter and not chilling, chilling in a, in a, in a yeah, big that, warehouse that, or something. No, no, that's right, not in your fridge. <laughs> no. Yeah, no, no, don't put them in your fridge. Um, uh, no, it means, you know, you need, uh, need cold, cold winter. in the winter. Yeah. And, and that, in, that stimulates um, bud break. Uh, so growth and yield, um, which obviously means you get more fruit. So that's very important. Um, and there is a um, there is a synthetic input used conventionally to to stimulate that activity, um, which is not permitted organically. Um, and that's a factor in the the biggest kiwi fruit producing region in New Zealand, where there is a bit of a lack of winter chilling, and they have to use that. And so the the absence of that in a in an organic system in that region means you tend to get a, a yield penalty. Um, Basically, whereas, meaning just uh, sort of to summarize that the region where most of the kiwis are grown now in New Zealand, either due to climate climate change yes. or in general, doesn't have that cold winter or doesn't have the cold winter anymore meaning they have Not, to use a, a strong chemical or a chemical substance to to fake yeah, the winter. That, that's right. And meaning that's right. they can't yeah, exactly. really switch to organic tomorrow because they, they would not be able to use that substance, thus won't have the same yields as before. Correct, yeah. So guys do, guys do convert yeah. um, and, um, you know, eventually get there. But you will, the, the average yield is, is lower and the, the so you chose to be somewhere region. else. I mean, that's the target. You chose yeah, yeah. a region where, oh, where it does get cold. Yeah. yeah, look, there's no question that the, the region that we have identified is better for growing organic kiwi fruit. I, there's just no doubt. And it's because of that extra winter chilling, because actually in the summer, the region I'm talking about has uh, higher heat units. So it, it's kind of a double whammy. You're getting better winter chilling, but then you're getting more heat through the summer. Um, so it's... Yeah, it's, it's significant. It, it, it essentially means you can deliver conventional type yields, but with the organic premium on top. And, and so your costs are lower as well? Are your inputs in, in Kiwi production, is that a big well, difference? Or? Well, your, your license costs currently are yeah, lower. Yeah, because I'm going to go to the slide on, actually, on because that's one of the... Uh, lower. Um, so just to... Uh, that gap we expect will close or narrow, um, but yes, your your cost of license is cheaper. Um, your your production is uh, high value. Um, the actual operating cost is is similar. Um, so that is not a marked difference uh, between the two. It'll depend on what you're specifically doing with your management system. Um, we think there is some scope to to be lower in cost of production if you can set the system up right. And that's what's attractive, one of the attractive things about doing a bare land development. Um, and if you're actually going to secure gold organic license, you actually have to have a bare land development. So what, what you're not allowed to take existing kiwi fruit in the ground and cut across to um, gold under an organic system. It has to be bare land development. But the exciting mean, thing about what, that what does it mean? Set the system up. Sorry. What does does that development you mentioned a specific type B and L development? What does that mean? Um, so I'm really just meaning, uh, you know, literally bare land. Ah, so, so really uh, from the ground panic. up, starting from zero. Yeah, yeah. How long does it take yeah. to before so, the fruits, before the vines are are not doing grapes but doing kiwi fruits? Yeah. So uh, you'll get uh, a harvest in year three. Okay. Uh, it won't it won't be a really proper commercial harvest. You'll get a more commercial type harvest in year four. You'd still expect to increase from that point on for a few years, but yeah. you'll. you'll and and when does it mature harvest. or is there a certain moment it goes down again? Doesn't, doesn't go down. They sort of go on forever. They're, they're, okay. they're absolute monsters, uh, kiwi fruit. They're just beasts. Um, 
So they, they can be a little susceptible to wet feet and to wind, but uh, the way you develop them, you have sort of nets and, and shelter and so on and so forth. So they're, they're very well protected from, from wind and you, you're, it's obviously important to find out about your soils that they're going into, that they're free draining, you know, fertile and free draining, uh, because wet feet are not good for kiwi fruit. But if you have those variables in place, uh, as I say, they are they're monsters. They just and in they terms grow. of soil, you can almost visually see them grow. And, and in terms of soil, um, what's their impact on the soil? Is there fertilizer necessary? What what kind of are you doing any intercropping? Is is it a monoculture plant? Well, what what how does the kiwi f- fruit plant feel or vine feels happy yeah so um obviously it is largely a a monoculture because it's a permanent crop but within that um you know we look at doing a lot of different things in between the rows uh you can sow um you know legume like clover and then you go through and cut it and um have, have it so that it shoots out of the mower under the vines so you're, you're getting a mulch which has obviously um, got nitrogen in it. Um, you can also uh, plant um, plants that will attract beneficial insects, so buckwheat and, and fasida and things like that. So there are different things you can do. And, and one of the things we're very interested in doing, which, which would be quite um, new and in- innovative, is to, is to plant a habitat around the outside so it acts as shelter, um, but also as a, um, a habitat for beneficial insects. Um, to, to sort of create that reservoir, if you like, of beneficial biodiversity. And we're quite interested in, in doing that. And, and because kiwi fruit aren't necessarily the sexiest plants for pollinators. Uh, so you, you need to do your best to create an environment where pollinators are motivated to, to stay there and spend some time there. So and that's part of what we, we seek to do with the, the system as well, which, which isn't generally otherwise uh, done as a deliberate action in setting up the system but that's what i was talking about in terms of you know setting up a sort of a purpose-built system for organic uh, performance for organic production and and in terms of of the structure obviously without giving investment advice which is not what we're doing but what are you looking i mean you're looking to develop um, um a farm basically from the ground up you have a, an interesting team here what, what's in in terms of the investor putting my investor head on What's in terms of the invest impact investment? Um, what what's the structure you're looking for? Is this a one-off thing? Are you going to do multiple? Uh, what do you see if, if we talk in a few years from now and, and the first one has his first semi-commercial harvest? Where what would you be looking at? Yeah, yeah I think um, it's interesting because it's it's not easy to deploy uh, big chunks of capital into into kiwi fruit. Um, the average the average size of a kiwi fruit orchard. In New Zealand, there's something like uh, 2.8 or 3 hectares for a gold orchard. Wow. So it's, it's very small. Um, you know, that, that said, one of the developments we're, we're looking at is would be about 15 hectares under canopy would actually be, be quite large. Um, and in a particular region, we're, I think it would be the second largest individual holding. So um, there is, can, there is canopy scope. Canopy here, just to be clear, means canopy of trees or canopy of nets? Yeah, so it's... Canopy means, if you like, the area that's got vines growing. Okay. And, and so we think of it as, as a netted area because we have nets over the top. Um, but basically, canopy is really referring to the kiwi fruit. Canopy. The kiwi fruit canopy, like the first picture we showed, basically. This one, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. So we can see all of those sort of leaves. Because if you're standing under kiwi, yeah, that's a, good, that's a great picture to show you. Because if, if you're standing under kiwi fruit um, in the sort of the peak of the, the season, as it were, there's not a lot of light coming through. You know, it's quite sort of a lot darker. And, and, and the so nets you put for birds or what's the, the purpose of the nets? Wind. Wind, Wind. is the biggest ah. thing. It's a bit of a help with birds, obviously, but uh, primarily it's wind. And would it be, because I've seen systems on, two, 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 I think Propagate Ventures was sharing a system for, I don't remember if it was apples or something, but in, in I think in Argentina, where they planted okay. a lot of very high trees around certain apple farms. So they basically caught the wind. So they, they created nets, but on the side and made of trees. And they've been doing that for 20 or 30, or I think even much longer, um, without netting it, basically, they managed to slow down the wind that came through their, their orchards because it was such a, it, it, probably the same with kiwis, it's such a, such a threat. But not from above, yeah. but basically on the Historically, side. Historically, they've had trees around them but um some of the first trees they used to plant um they found they were they were havens for a for a pest 
um, the pest really loved to live on that tree and then they'd sort of jump into the orchard. So that wasn't quite so successful. Um, so, um, you know, they've learned a lot more about yeah, that. Yeah. But the nets are, are extremely effective. Um, and as I say, we, we will utilize trees as well, or, or perhaps, you know, um, shrubs might be a way to put yeah, it. Insect, but, yeah. Trees, but ones that will create habitat. Um, you know, losing using a lot of native plants and so on and so forth. So, yeah. So, so uh, just sorry, there was yeah. just a side. Just to come back to the yeah, structure, yeah. you'll be doing a one-off for now. Is is it? I mean, so, depending yeah. on that, sorry, so yeah, yeah, that's that's right. At the moment, we've got we've got a one-off project, but there are other opportunities coming up in the pipeline. Um, as I say, look, you're not going to deploy. Um, big institutional type amounts of money into kiwifruit in New Zealand. Um, so if you were thinking the type of investor who might look at this, it might be, you know, high net worths and family offices and, and those types of investors. Um, because yeah, look, one or two projects, but there will be the opportunity over time, I imagine, um, given what we're seeing, that's our expectation that there'll be other other assets come up. Yeah. Um, but from a from an offshore capital point of view, um, bare land development works as well, um, as well as it does from the, the production sort of point of view and the license point of view. And that's because you have a, a the overseas investment office to, to go through here in New Zealand. And so that's a, a process and, and there are boxes that have to be ticked. Yeah, so of course. You're adding a lot of value to land if you develop land uh, from bare land into kiwi fruit. Yeah, because, because currently the land is, is used for uh, either cattle or it's bare land, right? Yeah, well, the sort the sort of land we're looking at is um, it's either grazing, it's got animals grazing on it, or um, it's being cropped for um, animal feed. Um, other properties, they might be doing some annual cropping, you know, possibly onions or something like that. But whatever it is you're you're doing, you're still taking it and um, turning it into a much higher value yeah. product or land use by you turning it to kiwi fruit. Great. I, I think we're going to switch to a much, much bigger project you're working on, which is okay. actually project regeneration, <laughs> which obviously caught my yep. attention. So let's go to that. So you mentioned dairy a couple of times, and we mentioned dairy actually a couple of times, and, and we have a nice overview of a number of, of dairy operations here. Um, it's a huge industry in New Zealand. It's a big part of your economy. Um, I mean, you're the 30% of all dairy exported in the world probably comes from from you know, your place in, in the world. What are the main issues? Why is, is this such an interesting space for, let's say an impact investor to, to get involved and why are you focusing on the dairy industry? Well, I think um, there's probably a couple of reasons why we're, we're focusing on dairy. Um, one is it's the biggest industry in the agricultural sector in New Zealand and by some way. The second thing would be that um, it has a reputation for being uh, dirty and polluting. Um, so as we can see in this river here, yeah. Dairy. Yeah, dairy is referred to as dirty dairying. Uh, and there has been a dramatic fall in water quality um, in these sort of catchments where dairy intensification has increased um, over in a relatively short period of time. You know, we're not talking sort of 50 years we're talking more like sort of you know 20 years and so that is becoming uh, socially unacceptable yeah i was just going to switch uh, to the slide where you share a bit more about that like peak cow is i think the first time we i've seen that somewhere. yeah that's that's right <laughs> yeah so that some of those headlines you know and this is coming from the minister of the environment and the um and the minister for um, primary industries or for agriculture in effect sort of saying you know we've, we've pretty much think we've reached peak cow so basically there's this there's this mood of change if you like and it's being brought about also by by actual regulation so nutrient loads are being capped and um, so the, the change is coming which is a good thing um, a lot of farmers don't think it is but we we saw that that was created an opportunity because you know where someone sees i know it's all changing and it's bad we'll have to leave well we see opportunity in that rather than something to run away from uh, and the opportunity is to go in um, acquire farms uh, transform those into um, regenerative systems that are generating better environmental outcomes but also you know good financial outcomes 
um, and um, and make um, or also make make people sort of take a different view on farming that it doesn't have to be about just making dollars and 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 sort of you know abusing the environment that actually we can we can make that environmental outcome sort of better. We can deliver better biodiversity. We can improve water quality from where it is now and still make money and make, you know, milk that is higher value. So, so create better financial outcomes as well as environmental. You know, I think it's, you know, intellectually we reject that um, concept that there is a trade-off between environment and, and profitability. We see the two actually as, as linked. You do a better job of the environmental and you will achieve a better outcome on the on the financial um, and frankly it has to happen the 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 sort of the in, the environmental uh, consequence is no longer something that can just be swept aside or or you know classified as um, someone else's problem you know that has to be deliberately confronted and regulators are seeking to to confront it and deal with it um, and that's the environment we go into and so that's why it's a good time in our view to be you know, looking at dairy yeah, so basically you're you're going in and, and and is it gonna be one watershed or one region where because obviously if you're all sharing the same river with all the farmers in a region, um maybe you, the farm you pick or that's for sale, you buy, you turn into beyond organic or organic regenerative. Um are you figuring out also which farm to pick to have the most impact on on that river or is that something you're you're thinking about how to have that eco ecosystem or watershed level thinking where are those i would almost i call it in the show every time acupuncture points where you can have the most potential <laughs> impact is that yeah. something you're thinking of yeah absolutely it is and certainly um with the the project we're looking at at the moment it's it's very much focused on a catchment now obviously there are neighboring catchments that you can you can look to as well um but it, it is focus on a particular catchment and then you know you know we're looking to uh, working closely with uh, those who have been studying those those areas you know particularly the, the regulators I'm thinking have been recording a lot of information and will have very good insight as to you know those key areas but um, you know certainly we're looking to so we target farms, for instance, that will have waterways going through them, um, which isn't actually that challenging to find necessarily in New Zealand, and particularly in this particular catchment. So um, there's there's a real opportunity to make a difference um, there. But that kind of insight is really useful and valuable. And I think the way we, we will do that in this situation is through that, um, that sort of collective approach. So working in with other stakeholders um, in the catchments. And that's the great thing at the moment, their appetite to make a difference and how we go about doing that. And historically, it's always sort of been a bit of a stick, oh, you must stop doing this and stop doing that. And, you know, that's achieved a certain amount, but this becomes, I think, a much more powerful sort of driver of, of change and deliverer of uh, improved outcomes. Um, so, yeah, but it's a really, look, it's a really good question, um, but we do try and specifically target areas and even farms that will have a an above the line um, degree of improvement and impact and and in terms of let's say you buy a farm and um, I would see it the first day or the day before you bought it and five days uh, five years later what are the main differences um, apart from getting your organic certification what would I see as main differences are different grazing are there going to be trees are, are the cows looking different are the diff different types of cows is the what's the the, the feel if, if you if a farmer would visit because I obviously don't see too many differences I mean I would see a tree but if a farmer would visit and and what would he or she see in in like a couple of years what would be the like whoa okay that I didn't expect or that that's completely well, different the, from what I know cows will have really big smiles on their faces okay, and they'll just they'll be much happier you'll see that but um no and look in reality uh, um you will notice dramatically different looking pasture uh, and the number of species in that pasture. Going uh, from what to what? What's your goal? Oh, well, what are they now? Well, generally you'll be going from potentially just pure ryegrass or ryegrass with a little bit of white clover to, uh, so let's say two varieties, to something that might have 15 or 20 different wow. species in it. So um, a variety of clovers, uh, maybe some lucerne, um, birds with trefoil, chicory, plantain, um, 
lots you, of different you, grasses. You, maybe row, different you plant that in or it comes back naturally? Yeah. Yeah. So you, you have, you have a rotation. So you don't go in year one and, and sort of, you know, plow up everything and sow new grass. Otherwise you're going to be struggling to feed your animals, but you'll, you'll have a, a system of renewal and you'll, you might accelerate that a little bit. You might increase it a little, little bit, but broadly you will, operate on that rotation of renewal to bring the new pasture in and you'll also find to an extent that once you have a, a level of that new pasture in the, the cows will also start to help spread it around the, the farm i mean whatever livestock system you have that that would happen um so yeah that but that's how you make it sort of work so that's a, that's something you will notice as a difference uh trees you'll see a lot more trees on uh, farms that that we're operating um and that might be natives up into scrappy steep gullies that aren't terribly productive um, could be plantations in those areas uh, could be more of a silver pastoral type system where you have rows of whatever it might be could be apple trees could be timber trees could be nut trees um, in paddocks um, and is that something that happens already is that something you no. see in New Zealand or that's pretty pretty new no, because the pictures no. I've seen the picture you shared in the presentation there there's hardly a tree inside yeah. yeah, yeah, no. Now, particularly New Zealand dairy farms, historically, it's always been seen that if you had a tree, it meant it was growing somewhere that couldn't grow grass. So you had to get rid of the tree so you could grow more grass. Um, the idea of sort of shelter for the animals, um, and you know, these something sort of just didn't come into the equation. It, that's starting to change, um, and so people are starting to sort of see trees maybe as as being an asset, which obviously they are. So, but you will see a lot more trees on farms and in ways that you wouldn't normally expect to see trees on farms as well. So, I mean, people will talk about riparian planting in New Zealand, um, but we will do that um, and to a high level. And I don't just mean lots of it, but in terms of um, thinking about the species we are putting in place and what else are they doing apart from retaining nutrient, because there's only, there's only so much they're, they're doing at that point, you know, when you're a meter or two away from the river, there's only so much they're sort of doing, but so, well, what else, what are the other benefits we're getting out of, out of those sort of systems and are there other things we can plant? So, you know, I, you know, we've talked in the past, you and I about um, plant medicinal type plantings so that animals can self medicate um, and other sources of fodder as well as the shelter and, um, you know, just rubbing posts, um, you know, this type of thing. So there's, you know, I mean, Trees are, trees are pretty cool things. Um, there are a lot of ways we can use them. There's a real drive to see more trees being planted in this country. Um, there's the carbon factor and the ability to, to drive you know, more income out of the use of trees as well. So there's, there's a lot of compelling reasons. And that's, that's a definite way you're going to see a physical difference on the farm. Um, look, another way might be that you change the breed of, of livestock you're dealing with. So I don't mean radically changing it from, from dairy cows to something else, but I mean the breed of cow you're utilizing, you may change um, in order to have a more or well, better adapted animal for an organic system. So one that's quite robust, produces off fodder, um, resilient calves easily, and all those sort of good qualities that, that, that you want in a, an organic system. And, and in terms of the... Big. Yeah, no, no, I... I, I the the we call them what is it, the Botox cows or whatever you, you give them. Yeah. They're, they probably won't survive very well in a, in, in a, a few more trees, some fodder and some, some herbal plants. They wouldn't know what to do with that. Um, and in terms of the other end on the sales part, I mean, I, I read here, you're, I mean, there are two main companies, one cooperative and the other not you can sell to, is there any direct market? Is there any margins um, apart from the organic premium? you're taking you're you're thinking about like at some point is there going to be a more farm to fork to come back to to your family's business previously is there more of a direct link is there something yeah, that you can play with in in new zealand or because it's export you have to go through these big players because otherwise you can't yeah it's i mean it's a great idea and um one i always loved in the in the uk but the reality is we just don't have the population here. I think if you're very close to a, uh, a significant town, and particularly if you're close to a, a tourist type town in New Zealand, then, then that can work, I think. And if you're a, you know, a relatively small, smaller artisan type, type thing, but the scale of farms we're talking about here, are quite, you know, these are pretty big farms. These are 800 cow type 
type mm-hmm. farms. Um, so the locals have got to drink a lot of that milk um, to, to make it stack yeah. up and also to pay a pretty good price for it as well. So reality is the nature of New yeah. Zealand is such that it's always going to be focused on, on the export. And, you know, I think that's important. Um, the, the, so you're going to be more of a price taker than, than a price giver because. Yeah. Oh yes. I mean, to, to an extent, um, with the processor, um, we are talking, and this is more of a, a North Island conversation than South Island and our focus tends to be South Island, but there are some, um, organizations in the North Island who are looking to uh, capture much more of that, that value uh, through higher value products and to get that back to the, the farmer. So we, we have talked to the process in, in the South Island about that. And I think there is a degree of appetite around um, creating a, a better share in the value that that is available to to high yeah, because if you're creating great absolutely great milk with different protein levels different nutrient levels and a much happier cows that hopefully give much better milk it, it's almost a shame if if that value is taken either by the processor or then by the marketing company that, that yeah well, but if that, that's the that's case right. then that's the case i mean there's no not too much you can do about it yeah. but you see a lot of no other regenerative farmers that at some point maybe they're into grain, they start a mill or at some point uh, they, they try to capture or they, with a few others, they start a processor themselves. But I've, I haven't seen anything honestly in, in dairy on that thing. And obviously you have a very particular uh, logistical situation as you export most of it. So there's a difference there, but it, you can see that movement in a lot of places, but maybe it's, it's too difficult for you at the moment. Yeah, no, I, th- I, I, I I do think there's the opportunity to, to do that. And I think we'll probably start to see that increase because I know that there is capital that is interested in, in much more of that vertical integration of that extending through the value chain and not just owning the, the say the farming assets and, and producing the milk, um, but in, in sort of processing it and then putting it into supermarkets in Asia or, or into North America or wherever it might be. And the, I mean, it's a, it's a good thing for us to look to do um, or to at least capture that because the, the value available through an organic product is, you know, really, really very, very significant. Um, there's a lot of margin in there to be, to be captured um, and for farmers to be rewarded. Um, so um, that's, it's a compelling uh, prospect for us to sort of, you know, work to just sort of capture more of that. And, and in terms of structure, this is very, very different from the Kiwi structure we discussed previously. This is a much oh, yeah. bigger opportunity. Your plan is to buy many farms and to really build a portfolio, which also makes sense for potential institutional investors, right? That's the, what I read, at least through, through these slides. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, the, the opportunity, because of the market conditions at the moment, because of size of individual farms, uh, because of the size of the market, is such that you can deploy a lot of capital and in quite good time uh, into into dairying in, in New Zealand. Um, I think it's it's pretty much exclusively into this kind of transformational regenerative approach. I think if you're offshore capital, you will struggle to deploy capital into uh, conventional. Um, why, why is that? Uh, the Overseas Investment Office. Um, they have to basically agree on every investment and they're much more likely to go for this type. Yeah, above four hectares. Um, and there aren't too many dairy farms in New Zealand smaller than four hectares. Um, so, yeah. Um, you know, and, and just to give you a, an idea, look, we're talking about, as I said, 800 cow type, type farms, you know, 15 and a half million dollars to buy the farm, the cows and everything else you need. So, um, you know, these are not small assets. Um, but... It's, it's quite a compelling um, sort of setup, the, the nature of the market, because, because of availability, um, because of valuations, because of the nature of the organic market, um, and because of some of these pressures coming on through regulation, the aging farmer population, the high levels of debt at the farm gate. You know, there are a lot of reasons which, which make it very interesting to, to look at at the, at the moment. And, and as I say, from that regenerative, if that's your strategy, um, if, you, if that's not your strategy, then I think you, you, you really need to sort of move on and look at other things or other places. But if you're adopting a regenerative approach and it's, 
it's measurable and articulate and uh, articulated and um, one that is uh, genuinely inclusive uh, with stakeholders um, in those catchments, um, then I think it becomes um, far more plausible or it becomes it becomes uh, an executable sort of strategy as opposed to one that is had its time. Yeah, I think it, it it's interesting as it's such a specific case. It's mostly export and it seems to be mostly um, potential investments coming from overseas. So it's it's a very particular case uh, when you look at the, the global agriculture market and, and yeah. that makes it, but you've yeah, always had that interaction. It's yeah. always been for export and, yeah. and lots of the money. I think we had a discussion previously as well on, on the local impact investing sector, which doesn't really exist yet or starting to emerge. But it's mostly Australia or mostly further away. And that's actually how we got connected as well. Um, so that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah, that, then, that, that, yeah. that's right. New Zealand is small, you know, there's, there's 4 million people, four and a half million people. And so uh, that means there's a small number of large investors, I mean, very small, uh, and the capital isn't, isn't that big. So to rely on, on domestic capital alone to drive impact type outcomes, um, it's, it's starting at a small level to happen, that's for sure. But um, relative to, to offshore capital, then, well, there's no comparison. So. Yeah, so I stopped the sharing and I, I would like to f end with a final question. I see that actually time has flown. Okay. Um, if you could wave your, your magic wand and, and tomorrow morning uh, <laughs> we wake up or in a few hours, because in your case, it's already evening. Um, what would you like to change in the ag or regenerative ag and, and the impact investing space? What would be your, um, your point to, to that? What would you wake up well, tomorrow and say, you have changed something? Yeah, I would like to see uh, a lot more capital being deployed into the regenerative ag sector and into making change happen. Because there is a lot of discussion about this. There's a lot of ESG reports produced. Um, there's a lot of even media coverage. But in terms of the, the actual activity on the ground, I mean, I think I literally know all the regenerative ag investment guys in the Western world. And I could probably have them over for a dinner party. You know, um, there might be one I'm missing out or two, but you know, two or three of the four of those guys, and that's about all there is. You know, I know them extremely well. And they're all great guys, all but yeah. um, all girls, of course. Yeah, the, the ones I know all actually are guys, but there might be girls out there as well. Which is yeah. an issue so, on my show, it's a small group of people. Yeah. I, I want much more gender diversity because in the impact investing space, it's much more balanced, but somehow when as yes, soon as you get to agriculture, right. it, it loses that yeah. gender balance completely, which is really annoying. So anybody listening or watching and knows any great people to interview, please think about gender balance because I need that much better. That's a good point. If you scroll down on, on the SoundCloud list, yeah. it's, it's quite embarrassing actually. But so you would change that, but how would you do that? What would be the main Yeah, because um, look, there's, as I say, there's, there's how do we so wake much up money investing? going into uh, traditional conventional agriculture that is is part of the problem not part of the solution mm -hmm. and where there's some very capable people doing great things in the regenerative space and it would be good to see those guys being rewarded for their their vision and their their passion and their ability to to make you know change happen yeah and, so and, and what do you think is the how could we do that i mean the magic wand is, is probably not going to work i'm sorry uh, to 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 bust no, up the, the bubble but how would be what would be one thing to, to wake up investors for soil or to even maybe the other part to, to see the risks they're putting to work now while, while they're investing in conventional chemical agriculture. What, what do you think is the main leverage point we have? Well, yeah, that's tough. It's a whole other hour. All I can do, yeah, yeah, <laughs> days. Um, I, I think all you can do is, um, is talk to, to facts, to what you know, to describe the sort of the situation. And then you need to find the, the right people. So you need to find the people who will be willing to um, support that and to whom it is important to support. And I think that's increasing. I think, say, particularly out of Northern Europe um, or say out of families who, who are getting that generational change, these types of things are becoming important. And so they become less of a nice to have and more of an essential to have. And I think that's, I'm hoping that's where we'll start to see 
sort of sort of change being driven through through that process. Um, but but otherwise, it's um, it's you know it is challenging. It becomes a case of you know articulating the story over and over again, um, finding people who understand it. Um, you know, and who have a have a desire to to pursue it, whether that desire is based on um, motivation around wanting to drive environmental change, or whether it's just recognition that hey, this is a really good idea, and there's this big trend sort of moving this way in the world anyway, so we we might as well get on board because we could make some money. You know, my view is if if people want to pursue it because they just want to make money, well, that's great because it's still doing the right thing, and I, I hope that they then like the, all the other sort of stuff as well, but. Um, yeah, I just, you know, those are the kinds of things that I think are driving the change. Well, that's what we need to see more of. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It's uh, it it really goes against many things that we we've learned and seen in agriculture, and and to question that or saying we can go much further than that is really difficult for people to get into their head. Like now, I've seen an organic farm. And the farmer is really struggling. So I know that organic farmers are struggling and, and we're never going to feed the world with that. And he's like, yeah, but I've seen others. And, and so that's a, that's, it's a very, very difficult narrative to get through. But the narrative is very strong and very good. And I think with, with the regulations that are now happening, that's a very interesting point in New Zealand that the outside pressure is going to be stronger. And there is a huge pull factor because the export market is, is so interested in this stuff. So that, that, that yeah, hopefully exactly. it's like an inflection point. So I want to thank you so much for your time. It was great to learn more on New Zealand, more on kiwi fruits that I never knew before, and more on, on dairy. And, and of course, to see like quite a particular but very interesting um, agriculture situation and impact investing situation where both the export is, is the key driver, but also the import or, or the investment coming from overseas. So you have those two uh, pooling points basically working together. So it's a uh, it was great spending your evening. Thank you so much for taking the time this Monday evening. And um, I, I hope to check in with you soon again and, and learn, learn much more on other projects you're working on. Great. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you, Kern. And so nice to catch up. And uh, I hope to speak again soon. And thank you for being part of this experiment. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's been great. Loved it. Enjoyed it a lot.